The blessing or the barrier, God's generosity is for all. This week's story draws out of the Bible readings how God is extraordinarily generous to those who simply seek him. But if we come with a sense of entitlement, we may be disappointed. It's Ian Gregg here again, and we're looking at God promising King David a successor in 2 Samuel 7, the promise of Jesus' compassion for all in need who draw close to him, that's towards the end of Mark 6, and teaching for the early church in Ephesians 2 that all who simply believe in Jesus are promised access to the Father without favouritism or discrimination. Details are repeated in the notes underneath. So in the first snapshot this week, we join King David, who has won a series of military campaigns and taken over the hilltop city we now know as Jerusalem, and he's built himself a palace overlooking the city. After a long, slow praise procession, the precious Ark of the Covenant has been brought up to Jerusalem and installed in its special tabernacle tent in this high-up stronghold near to David's palace. But he has a conscience from the Bible. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. David wants to build God a palace as well, a temple. And Nathan, his chief advisor, who is also a man of deep devotion and prophetic anointing, has sought the Lord about this and brings back a word for David. But it is not the word that David wants to hear. This is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build a house to dwell in? When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is a double prophecy, and it speaks to more than one time frame. That's a bit difficult for us to grasp. We have watches and clocks, calendars and appointments, and we are very time conscious. But God dwells outside time, so he can relate to the beginning of time, the creation, and also the end time when Jesus returns and everything in between. Helped by hindsight, we can see that this points first to David's son Solomon, who did build the temple and consecrate it. But it also points to David's much, much later successor, Jesus of Nazareth, whose return and full reign we await with trepidation. Reading the whole passage, it is clear that it amounts to a covenant, a promise by God to David about what God would do through him. Firstly, it would be through him that the magnificent temple would be built, and controversially, it would be a place where not only Jews, but also God's seekers from other nations could come close to God. God's generosity is for all. The temple, with its army of priests and their Levite assistants, served its purpose as the central place of worship for about a thousand years, until Jesus' death and resurrection. Then, and especially following Pentecost, there was no need for a separate order of priests to perform their rituals, because those who believed and received Jesus had their own direct access. They could know God personally. And that's where we are today. We don't need a cast of separate, religiously endowed people to be go-betweens between us and, and finding God. God's generosity, especially through Jesus, is for all. Secondly, it would be through his family line that the Messiah of God, who we know as Jesus Christ, would come to proclaim his everlasting kingdom. That just rule and kind reign has started already in heaven. Well, it's up to us to tell people about it, to tell people that God's generosity is for all before Jesus returns as the visible king of an everlasting kingdom. The kingdom of God is the subject of the next snapshot, which is around the time of the feeding of the 5,000, a huge sign of God's generosity that for Jews 
recalled his miraculous provision during the years of wandering in the wilderness. But this picture is not of that scene, but around the edges of it. Imagine a community of people who could just about get enough to eat and support themselves, as well as paying the temple tax and the Roman tax. Now, if you couldn't work, you couldn't earn. Sickness and injury were serious problems. Only the rich could afford the limited help of someone like Dr Luke, who also wrote a gospel and a sequel called Acts. But the people had got the message that this Jesus of Nazareth had God's power to restore broken and disabled people and heal those who were sick and afflicted. Because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognised them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The crowds kept coming. The needs were overwhelming. And Jesus, fully God but also fully man, needed to eat and rest. Heading out on the lake in one of the disciples' boats was sometimes the only respite. But people could see the boat, especially if it was just crossing the bay, and work out where it was heading, and they would run and carry their sick friends to get there first. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or the countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Desperate people. But, as we've read, he had compassion on them, verse 34, even though it was physically impossible for him to pray for everyone. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. God's generosity is for all. Some people didn't receive. There were Jews who thought that those who carefully kept all the religious laws were the ones who deserved God's blessing. And some of those crowding around Jesus in Galilee's mixed populations were not even Jews. Not long before, Jesus had been forcibly ejected from the Nazareth synagogue where he had been speaking for suggesting that God's generosity was for all people. It is a picture of sharp contrast. Rich and poor, observant ones and Pharisees and ordinary people, Jews and those of other races. God's generosity is for all. The third snapshot in this week's story is of the early church where some struggled with the way God's favour came on the new Greek converts who came knowing nothing at all about the one living God. Others in the church were Jewish converts with a centuries-old tradition of being God's chosen people. Surely this gave them some entitlement. So they looked down on the converts from pagan beliefs and made them feel inferior. In his letter, Paul challenges this. Remember that at one time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the word. But now in Christ, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is the religious spirit that stifles many churches and turns them effectively into clubs for the like-minded rather than mission stations for the kingdom of God. Jesus is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh, dying on the cross, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace 
and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. The only distinction that heaven makes is whether we have received and believed in Jesus or whether we are still stuck in our doubts. Once we have trusted Jesus for who he is and what he has done for us, it makes no difference what man-made tradition we lean to. We are part of the kingdom of God, part of what Jesus was talking about when he said, I will build my church. God's generous gift in Christ is the same gift for all. Well, thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to being with you next time, next week. And until then, may God bless you warmly. Amen.